These hands have touched so many. Marion's hands. In recent years, students have been drawn to Marion Rosen and to her work. An institute has developed to support it and to provide training in the Rosen method of body work. Here you see Marion doing a demonstration in one of the training classes at the Rosen Institute in Berkeley, California. Many of the students watching will go on to complete the three-year training program and become Rosen work practitioners. In August of 1983, a few students gathered in Marion's home to hear her tell her story, the story of the evolution of a life's work. This videotape is for all of us whose lives she's touched. So we're ready to start whenever you are. And my basic question to you, as I told you a few minutes ago, I've really never heard your story. I've heard bits and pieces uh, of uh, your history and the work, but I haven't heard the whole thing evolve. And I really just have a fundamental question of how did you get drawn into <coughs> that kind of work? Body yeah. work? Well, it was a very easy thing because, as usual, when you get drawn something, there was a, a personal need you know, that was being met. And I had asthma when I was a child and was dragged around to many doctors and nobody really knew what to do with me. And I always said, I can't breathe. That was the thing. I didn't really have the, what people say, asthma attacks. I just always felt I couldn't breathe. And after a while, when I grew up, that got better. I guess when I got about to be 13 or 14 and became very independent, that went away. But I never quite forgot that feeling, how that was when I couldn't breathe in this world. And people always told me, they said, you know, there are people who can teach you about breathing. Maybe you should learn that. And so in my mind, I always had the feeling, ah, that's a little too loud now. Mm -hmm. I had the feeling that I really would like to, to do that, but I didn't do anything about it. So the time went on and I started, you know, went on with my schoolwork and ended it just at the time when Hitler came to Germany. And that was a very devastating time for me because being Jewish, everything seemed to fall to pieces at that point. My friends couldn't be with me anymore because it was dangerous for them. Why? Can you just ask where you were at this time? I'm sorry, I forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Nuremberg, my hometown, mm -hmm. and I was at that time staying at my parents' home was a very comfortable, very friendly home. And I had two sisters and a brother. And I was a third child, so I don't know if that needs of any significance. Is that close to a big city or way in the It country? is a big city. It is a fairly big city. But it is not a not a capital, but it is a big city. And it was a big city, and we lived in a small suburb of it, close to the woods. Mm -hmm. So this was a place I'm very identified with, you know, where you were close to a big city, and yet you were out in the woods, mm -hmm. had the greenery around, like I've always seemed to look for. Well, then I was in Nuremberg, and I was 19, and I was done with school. There wasn't really anything for me to do. I had to leave the country if I wanted to live my life. And I had to find something to support me because I was not allowed to take any money along. My parents were quite wealthy and I've been brought up with the idea that never in my life would I have to do a stroke of work, <laughs> which was 
I must say, not very attractive to me because I always like to do something and I don't like hobbies. So I didn't quite know how I would, what I would do with my life, except having babies, I knew I wanted to have that. Uh, so I tried several things, you know, that I could do. I tried to learn to type, and I was impossible. <laughs> I was just impossible. And I tried to take shorthand, and I couldn't read the shorthand. <laughs> also, it was much too slow. I tried to do some cooking or some housework, and everything burned. I mean, it was just <laughs> impossible. Whatever I started to do, it said absolutely no, not that. I couldn't go to the university, which I might have liked to do, because I wasn't accepted at that time. Because you were Jewish, is that what they yes. said? That was the law there already. So, I w we went on a vacation, and I was maybe about 20 or 21, and I'd been at home that time, looking around. And my mother broke her leg, and she broke her leg. <coughs> and that day, when I was on a hike away from the house I was up in the mountain somewhere and when I came back she said I found somebody for you to train you there was a woman who had taken care of her after she'd broken her leg and helped her and that woman was a Mrs. Lederer Mrs. Who? Lederer was her name and she worked in New York with a woman called Karen Horney was a psychiatrist and what she was doing was breathing and relaxation exercises mm -hmm. and she said to my mother you know my friend from Munich is coming the ones who trained me maybe she would train Miriam I don't know how they got to that point even but anyway by the time I came home there were these two ladies waiting for me whom I met and you know how it is you immediately know they are the same kind they are your kind so they were in their 40s and I was beginning 20s and then Mrs. Hyer said would you like to come I said yes I would like to come and so I started work with her or nothing else except that she was teaching breathing and I wanted to learn how to breathe and I had no idea what it involved. Going there meant in Munich? And going there meant in Munich, which was about 180 miles, 180 kilometer away from my home. But it meant to go away from home, to go to a different place, and to take up a training, which I knew nothing about. So the first day, I leave a lot of other little things are about difficulties, about leaving home. You know, at the last moment, my mother decided she could do without me or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> she, it was her yeah. idea, and then she it was decided, idea that she decided she was sick and she couldn't, whatever. Do you mean how old were you at this point? Twenty-two by that time. Twenty-two. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I went to Munich, and I had my first appointment with Mrs. Heyer. And I remember the day very definitely because I had some very bad cramps that day. I said, my God, what a day to have to start. And I told Mrs. Heyer that I wasn't feeling good. So she asked what it was, and I said, told her. And then she started working on me. And she hadn't worked longer than about 10 or 15 minutes, and the pains were gone. And after an hour, I knew there would not ever be any other work that I wanted to do. It was that easy. It was just it, you know, and this is how it came about. So I just, that was quite a few years ago, you mm -hmm. figure right. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. How similar is that to what you do now? It is, it is similar and it's different. But I was very definitely the, the touching part, the actual doing part, 
was very much alike it. And the breathing, breathing part? Breathing part, totally so. And how they went about, you know, to get to the breathing, to get to the relaxation. So that was the core of what I learned and what I did. Also the core of my experience about the world. What I found out <coughs> in the course of being there, in the course of learning to massage, in the course of learning to touch people. At that time they didn't have many, by the way, many pupils. I was allowed to be present as many many of their treatments, which was fantastic. This is why I duplicated that with Sarah. So I could see what the people, what Mrs. Hyatt did, and also what happened to people as she was doing it. She was working in conjunction with her, hus her ex-husband, who was a psychiatrist, and he worked with people on a psychological basis, and at the same time had Mrs. Hyatt and some of the other people that were around them work with the patients on a physical level. And what they found out is that the treatment, instead of taking years, would be cut down tremendously, maybe sometimes months, to, to months instead of years, or to weeks instead of years. They had, in the end, a lot of people coming to them from other parts of the country just to experience their work, work with them, and who only could come for a limited time and work with them. How frequently did they work with patients and how frequently did the patients see the psychotherapist? I really am not quite sure, <coughs> but it was not a daily treatment. If I remember right, it was about twice a week if they came, and it was about once or twice a week for the physical treatment, if I remember right, but I could not swear to it now. See, I was so unconscious about everything at that time. I didn't put it together from, from the start, you know, this is what is being done, and this is what adds. I just learned it, you know, from somebody looking in through a window and see, my goodness, what is happening? Here this person all of a sudden doesn't have pain. This person looks very different. This person all of a sudden smiles and is happy, you know, and this person lost their fears. You know, what's going on about this? So this was a very slow process till I started putting that together in my own life. And they were very good about this. Maybe they taught me about it. Maybe they talked about it. But as far as I remember, it took me a while to figure these things out for myself, how they work together. And I think that came in as a very good thing later on when I started putting things together and we started working on it again. Was, it, was this breath work that they were doing relatively new? Was it their concept or did it come from... Mrs. Heyer had been training with Elsa Gindler, and it was Elsa Gindler's concept. That is why I always say I'm the granddaughter. Elsa <laughs> Gindler was somebody who had the one who, who, had put, this who had put this, yeah, this breathing concept together. And I don't think that she necessarily thought of having it done in connection with psychotherapy. But she must have known there was a psychological in a factor to it because the breathing is so influenced by any kind of psychological states. She could not have missed it and I'm not quite sure about it. Yeah. And she cured herself of TB yes. through the breathing. Through the breathing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there was definitely a physical factor and an emotional factor. But at that time I was not a physical therapist and of course I was not a psychotherapist. So I I was just me learning something that I had never heard of before. 
Could you describe something of uh, what war, what the training consisted of, and how, also how long it lasted? Yeah. <coughs> I was Miss, Miss Mrs. Hire for a year and a half at one time, and then another half a year afterwards. I was, I was six months. I was in in England, trying to get to work that way at this Tavistock Clinic, and then. When it didn't work, came back again, worked another six months with Mrs. Hire. Uh, so two years was my training uh, time. And I think this is why I thought two years would be a good training time for others. And thinking about it afterwards, it showed me how long it took me you know, for each step to become my own, for each step to become something I could use again and do something with it. With it any. Uh, I get the impression that your training was uh, more frequent or more intensive. I worked every day yeah. somewhere with them. Sometimes something I didn't mention was the exercise classes. So sometimes we had the exercise classes. Sometimes I had the you know, I had a treatment, and I think the treatments I had were once a week. Uh, in the beginning, I also did not work on people very often, but I was allowed to watch a lot. And this is why my idea about watching and seeing it, you know, seems important, because this is what I learned. And this, in the end, you know, I was starting to teach Sarah when she first came to be trained. By actually having her watch you. And so watch you me. Watch. watch me and watch the person that I worked on to see what would happen if you worked this way. Yeah. Just, just to see the, the process of what went on. So again, I had some lessons every day, but not a lot of each of them at any one day. The theory behind it was, at the time, I do not really know very much about it. <coughs> I learned to massage. It's a lesson this way. But there was not much theory I was told about it. Uh, and uh, Mrs. Hyer wrote more about it in later years. But at that time, I don't think that she had verbalized, I uh, mean, formalized what she was doing in connection with the, with the psychotherapy. It was again more of an experience than a real training that we went through. But I want to say again, when I went to England, to London, uh, after the training, in order to show my new learned skill into my horror found, it didn't work. It absolutely didn't work. Here were very well trained psychiatrists who did things one way, and they didn't know what to do with me, and I didn't know what to do with them. So it the people lost their, they lost their symptoms. I remember, you know, I worked with them, and one girl, she lost her anxieties. But the doctor said, well, so she loses her anxieties, but she isn't any better. Well, for me, her anxieties was all that counted. Another young boy couldn't read. He had lost, the, not his sight, but he couldn't read. He was somebody who was a, took orders for a grocery store and all of a sudden couldn't read the orders anymore. And after working with him for a while, he could read again. You know, and then found out what he really wanted to read was poetry. And that was also something they didn't know what to do with it. You know. So he can read his orders and can read poetry, but he still is not cured, you know. In my point of view, he was cured, 
and theirs he wasn't. So there was something that didn't fit together. Did you have a chance to work on any of these uh, psychotherapists in England? I never attempted to. Uh -huh. yeah, so I they didn't have the experience of it, they have the inner conviction that's so important. No. And I didn't, didn't even think about it. Don't forget, I was a 23-year-old with something, you know, very exciting going on. Never known how to put herself out there. Never knew how to sell anything. I just did not have the, the skills that it would have taken, and not the know-how. I did not know where the point was where we didn't connect. Just didn't know that. Because after this, the, the, the chapter for me was in a way closed <coughs> because I really didn't quite know what to do from that on. But I left Germany not long after that. Excuse me, at what point did it close? Because it didn't work in England? It didn't work in England. Mm -hmm. And there was no way in Germany that I could work with it. Because of the political Yes, that's right. So I had to decide where I wanted to go. And I wanted to go to America in the worst way. And I came back to Germany in order to apply for going to America. And I wanted to go to America because I understood that in America you could do any kind of work you wanted to, you know, and just try it. And this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to be allowed to do any kind of work that I would like to do. And I just, for some reason, had put it in my mind that I was going to go to America. And so this is what I was intending to do. But in the next almost two years that I had to wait in order to get my visa for America, I was in Sweden. And I was not allowed to work there. <coughs> uh, it's very hard in Sweden to get permission to work as a foreigner. But I worked uh, without a permission treating people. <coughs> and uh, had a lot of fun working. And had really very good results on people even if they did not have uh, psychotherapy. They did lose pains and they did feel better. But I also used that time to go to the official physical therapy training that they gave in Sweden. They accepted me there. And that was very, very good and very important for me because that gave me the physical background, a very good background as how sicknesses, how difficulties, you know, come into being and what you can do surgically and afterwards in order to work with them. And also at that time, I would watch uh, exercise or dance classes. This is how I spent my free time. Sitting around people's studios and watching them dance. Sometimes by the hour, three or four hours. And if you want to know why I did it, I was bored. And I was lonesome and it was nice to be with people. It was nice to watch them. And I was allowed to take part in the ex in the dancing once a week and for that I exchanged with some of the teachers in treatments and now with those people the most fabulous things happen and I must say you know really this kind of uh, miracles that we have gotten used to uh, that I had not myself experienced this one woman who was supposed to give a, a dance performance and called me in the morning. I was skiing and the loudspeaker called my name, said to come back to the city, you know. And she had a lumbago and couldn't move. 
and by that evening, we had her moving. Yeah. And it wasn't anything else, basically, than what we are doing now. We weren't, I was not as skilled in talking as we are now. And I did not connect things like I do now, when people have that. But some of the difficulties about her situation came up. And she, anyway, she could, in the evening, go on the stage and dance, which was tremendous thing for me, you know, to happen. And with the other dancing teacher, too, who had hurt his ankle, they couldn't move it, which you would think is a very physical, <coughs> orthopedic kind of condition. But I worked on it for about an hour, maybe three times a day, and the pain went away. So from then on, I was allowed to take more lessons. Mm -hmm. And I was welcome, you know, mm -hmm. to be there a long time. What I want to say about this time, too, which was a very hard time to sit and wait, to have no money, because I couldn't get money really for anything, to be invited somewhere. Were you alone? Did I you was with family? my sister. With your sister. Yeah, so that was wonderful. And we had, you know, we ate spaghetti every day. It was just enough for that. It was lovely. Uh, but after that time was over, I found myself with a wealth of information. And I did not know that until I finally had come to the States. Yeah. This is later a the woman who originally trained me had offered me a job with her in New York. And I was going to go there to work with her for Karen Horney, for some of the people she worked with. But what happened is that the Germans invaded Norway before that came about. And I could not go on a boat that was crossing German waters and going to New York. So I had to come through the other way, through Japan and through Russia, uh, Russia and Japan from the place I came. And what happened with that is I arrived in San Francisco. And I arrived in San Francisco, <coughs> staying then with a family that was my extended family, the Gersons, who lived not more than about three blocks from here at the time. And when I arrived here, I just said again, I'm never leaving here. Mm -hmm. I don't care about any jobs. I don't care what else I'm going to do. But what I know is that what I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do here. So, this is how I got started here. Uh, pretty soon after arriving, I, I met, you know, I was visiting some different doctors and told them what I was doing. And they were all a little bit skeptical, but they did send me patients to work on. I couldn't really quite explain to them what I was doing. Uh, but as I worked with them, it was, uh, I had the training, you know, from Sweden. Did you have a physical therapist sort of degree or like that was useful here? It wasn't really useful, but I had the Swedish uh, paper that I had done a year and a half of their training, and I had passed the exam. But anyway, at that time you could just work. It was all right. But the important thing was that most of the people they sent to me seemed to get better. In the beginning, I didn't have an office. I just went to the people's houses. Then the war started here also. 
very soon after, I think it was in 41. And people needed uh, help in their, you know, in the hospitals for treating people physically in physical therapy. There were very few physical therapists here. It was a very beginning profession. And so they asked me if I would work at a hospital here. It, it permanently it was called at that time in Richmond. And of course I was very, very happy to get a job. And I was especially happy that it was a job that I could work swing shift in. That means from the late afternoon to midnight. Because by that time I had started to go to the university and to study pre-med. And I thought it would be a good idea to become a doctor and not to have to worry about other people referring cases and also be a little bit more independent on who I wanted to treat and also wanted some more information about the workings of the body, which I was, you know, was fairly new at by the time I was 24 maybe or 25. And I felt I really needed more. You want to ask something? Yeah. 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 Uh, so I went in the mornings. I went to the university. And the evenings or afternoons, I worked at Kaiser. And that was really my learning. <coughs> my biggest learning process to try out whatever I knew at that time. And I think from that time on, I became a physical therapist still knowing what I knew from Munich. But working in more conventional More therapy. in a very conventional surrounding. But still when people had a headache, when people had non-specific pain, when people had any kind of psychosomatic difficulties, they would always refer them to me. So I could work with them. And they would usually get well, which I have to say. Which you please got a reputation for it. Yeah. I got the reputation that when you had this kind of thing, you just would be sent, you know, to me. And this is, yeah, this would work then. And it did. But I didn't call it anything different. I call it physical therapy. I worked there for three years. And after that, I, the war was over. Three years, four years, maybe three and a half years. No, something else happened in between. They paid me much less than they paid the other physical therapists. And I got furious about that. As I often do, get furious uh -huh. about something. Why? Because you didn't have a license? Or? I didn't have a license. And I did a tremendous amount of work. More people got well that I treated than any of the others. Uh -huh. And they paid me. Uh, as much as in months that a shipyard worker would get in a day or so. And that was really something I didn't want to do. So I looked around where I could get my official training. At that time, they needed some people to train at the Mayo Clinic. They offered free trainings because there was such a, a tremendous uh, need for physical therapists that they tried to you know, to get fast trainings for physical therapists and free. Mm -hmm. And I wrote to them and they accepted me. This is because of the, all the wounded soldiers? That's right. Soldiers and, of course, also the shipyard workers, you know. Every day they lost was a, a loss to the industry. Mm -hmm. so Big shipyards in Oakland, is that right? In or Richmond. In Richmond. Yeah, there were the Richmond shipyards. They were losing a lot of time because of injuries? Yes. And when they came to our department, they found out they didn't lose that much time. It was a very, very good physical therapy department. And also, you know, there were some very good people there at that time. Well, they were, at Kaiser, they were appalled that they had the gall to go away for, for a year or whatever yeah. Lenny took. We had 10 hours instruction at that time at the Mayo Clinic. At that time, I also went without money. I had enough for my, to go there for my fare back, back and forth. But I didn't have any money to live there. So I did 
some bathing or tables, you know, in the evenings. Very good waitress. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did some translating for the department there. They had done some research on chiropractors and osteopaths in their training. And they paid me very well for translating them. So I could do that. But the very nice thing about it was that I was really academically even, I was a very bad student in pre-med. But the moment I got into physical therapy, I just was way ahead of everybody. So much so that at the end of the course, they told me, you know, you really didn't need that course. You had all the information that we could provide. And yet I was very, very happy that I'd been there, so I knew everything, everything in order, that I really knew, that I knew what to do, you know, and how to go about working. But as they needed me so much in, in California at that time, they let me leave after the six months of the theoretical work and said it would be all right for me to go back to my job mm. as that was anyway and that they were satisfied mm. that I had the you know the qualifications so I got my official physical therapy registry which I still have and which is still a very important thing to have for working you know, in in any kind of physical I also got a lot of knowledge by being in a big clinic that was treating cases that I'd never seen before. So I must say for that I was very glad that I could go there and that in spite of being such a big clinic and having the variety of whatever we were doing, I felt that the work I was doing, whatever I was doing, was holding up very well and was even there they would send me the psychosomatic cases they weren't very interested why but they learned after a while you know, to refer them to me have, have us have me work on them it seems like you got approbation for your work really from the very beginning you <coughs> got results in that it was noticed that's right I can really say that. And there was never a day that I was without work. There was always, you know, when I left one job, it was because another, the next one, had asked me to, to do something else. This is what I was doing. <coughs> but from uh, Mayo Clinic, I went back to the job in Richmond, where I now got the same pay as the others. <laughs> and it was a very good and fruitful year till the end of the war and then I took a vacation when the war was over and went back to Europe for a few months and when I came back again I did not want to go back to the hospital because I had been so tired that for six weeks I really couldn't move I was so tired and I decided there must be another way to live than working that hard. We did about 40 patients a day. Wait, 40. You, not by yourself? Yes, You're each of us did 40 a day. 4-0? Four 4-0 oh. a day. <laughs> sometimes we had 10 minutes, sometimes we had 20, <laughs> sometimes we had an hour. They still got well, they still got better. Okay. Yeah. I think it's very generous of you to certify us after only 350 hours. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's yes. incredible. It was an incredible month. Three years I was there. But the first few weeks I came home from work and I cried because there wasn't anything else I could do. <laughs> yeah. But I, I was so worn out. And then, you know, the next morning I had to go to school. I made pre-med, but just I had to repeat one course, and it was, you know, 
had very poor grades, not good enough for medical school. There's something that happened at that time. One of Kaiser's sons had multiple sclerosis and they offered to pay for the medical school if I would treat him exclusively at that time and do that. And I didn't accept it. Yeah. I was somehow not what I wanted. I wanted to treat many people. I did not have to be stuck for four years just with that one person. And maybe it was very short-sighted. But I wanted to go to medical school in order to do that work. I don't, didn't want to do that work in order to become a doctor. So that was a very different kind of a thing that I wanted to do. But as it turned out, I didn't even get accepted into the medical school here. I would have had to go probably to Pennsylvania or somewhere. And I didn't want to leave here again. I wanted to be here. I didn't want to do my work. And so I went. Uh, after the war into a private office that the boss who was working with me at Kaiser had asked me to go in with her. She had had this private office all along, just during the war, had worked at the hospital, had supervised the work there. It was with Florence Burrell, who was an absolutely excellent physical therapist, also somebody with many ideas and with an incredible feeling for the body. So I did learn a lot from her at that time, you know, how the body should work. But what I also found out that what had happened to me after the time in Sweden and all that watching and sitting around, that I had gotten an idea about how bodies work, <coughs> you know, how bodies move and how they really work the best. What you know, what you have to do, how you have to be in order to let your body work. And maybe I got also an idea about what people do that won't let them move, you know, what people do that won't let the body work, you know, what came in there. Well, I found out just by default somehow that I'd learned that during that time and being around it. And so I also started, like, besides the physical therapy work, I started an exercise class. My idea was <coughs> that when you can move, when you learn how to move, that you really do not need to get sick you should be able to move to move in a way that your body will go on moving. You'll be happy to move. You will not get sick. So I started out with Sarah's and Ellen's mother is one of my pupils. And three of her friends, they were in the first class. In a very little place. There were four people. I remember going and watching them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and I she had to walk on our backs, too. Oh. At that time, she was seven, and she didn't weigh more than we could just stand. Well, anyway, these were the people that I worked with. And I don't know, out of the four people, one, two, three, I think, are still in the exercise class. Mm -hmm. and How that, many years ago was this now? And that was 26 years ago. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> but the nicest thing is that one of them is now 81 and is my absolute star pupil, <laughs> which is Christine Sears. Mm -hmm. When you see her move, it is a joy because she can do just anything anybody needs to do. And when she gets an ache or pain, she goes to Sarah 
and after two or three treatments. Disappears totally. Mm -hmm. I don't see it again for years. <laughs> oh, it disappears. So I feel somehow that I have made at least some point or some inroad with this idea. It was a very important idea to me. That if you move, and if you move in a way that the body needs to be moved, that it will go on moving and it will not cross you up. When it crosses you up, it is for another reason. Yeah. I didn't really think that, that good about it yet. Mm -hmm. you know, this is what I think about it now. So I'm a little ahead. Well, anyway, I was in a physical therapy department, and at that time, I was getting a little elderly, and my friend Krilla was getting a little elderly, well, not very elderly, I was about my later fifties at that time, that Krilla was a little bit older than that, and most of our doctors had retired, some had died. The new doctors weren't very interested in what we were doing. We weren't really very busy. And at that time, uh, girl called Sarah, Sarah Webb, called me and said, <coughs> uh, can you teach me what you used to learn in Munich, how you started out working? And I said, oh, I've never taught, no, I can't do that. <laughs> but shortly before I take a training called EST, which made a big difference in me in my life because I found in that training that I was very different from the way I had presented myself to the world. That I really knew much more that I let on because I always thought it wasn't so good for girls to be so smart. <laughs> <laughs> I was very busy hiding whatever I knew. And after Est, I didn't need to do that. And another thing happened too, that they said, you don't know that you can't do anything until you've done it. <laughs> and if you do it and it doesn't work, you can still say, I can't do it. <laughs> but first you have to find out if it works. So I called Sarah back <laughs> and said, I don't know if it will work. <laughs> but I could teach you what we used to do. And she said, fine. One thing I want to say too, that I'd known Sarah since she was two years old, and I'd watched her dance at her dance class together with my daughter, with Mimi Kagan. Mm -hmm. And I always thought, oh, it's a special little girl. You know? <laughs> it's always been special. And so it was very peculiar to me to think, here is that special little girl asking me for something. And I say, no, it was very crazy. <laughs> so I said, you know, this is how I reconsidered. It was one of the parts I reconsidered about. And we started working, and I really have a very unclear idea <laughs> how I went about it. I don't know how often I worked on you at the beginning. Not, not that much, week. once a week. How often I had her come in with a, with a patient. She took some of her friends in, <laughs> some of her family in and worked on them. And then the miracles happened again, you know, uh -huh. even with that. Right. And it wasn't so drastic really, but the people got a treatment and they wanted to come again. And the people got a treatment and they wanted to bring their friends in. So before we knew it, there was a whole line of people who wanted to be worked on by Sarah, you know, for while I was working with her. So that came about. And as far as I knew about theory, you know, I would just teach her as we went along. I also didn't want her to learn any other massage. I didn't want her to learn any, anything else. I wanted to just 
train her myself and see what would happen. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about that, about why you didn't want her to learn anything else? I didn't want her to go into any cliché. I wanted to teach her hands how to feel. I wanted to teach her hands what to do when they felt something. See, I'd learned massage doing one, two, three strokes one side, and one, <laughs> two, three the other side. And then you roll, and you roll, and you roll, and you do this and that, you know. And I did not want her to even start with that. I, d I didn't want to leave her any out. If she touched somebody, she really had to touch that person, which I know now. She had to touch the person with intention, with an intention to feel for something, with an intention to get information, and with the intention to maybe have something happen with that person that has not happened before, that was maybe necessary or facilitate something to happen. We weren't that clear about this at that time. We just wanted to work. We wanted her to feel where there was tightness. We wanted her to see where there was no breath. And I wanted her to experience the same thing. I'd like to interrupt and ask Sarah, if you'd move your chair more so I can get you in this. <laughs> and what I'd like to know yeah. from you is what led you to call Miriam? What was wrong with that? <laughs> well, I had had I had had a terrible year the year before, I mean, you know, just a real crisis in my life, and I was extremely tense, and I, you know, I had headaches all the time, and, um, <coughs> you know, I mean, my life, I got fired, and I left my boyfriend, and I discovered during that period of time that, you know, yoga made a big difference to my, first to my body, and then to my world, um, and that somehow changing the body could really affect you know, my life, or, th you know, could make it better. So that was my first clue that the body might have something to do with, you know, the mind, I think. <clears throat> and um, my mother was one of the four people in Marion's original exercise class, and, and she was the one who told me, well, you're floating around, you don't know what to do with yourself, you've been washing dishes here for a year or something like that. Call Marion and, and see, what, you know, what she if she teach you something about body work. Now my mother had a selfish motive in that she wanted private treatment. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I did call her and you know and she kind of, you know fluctuated and then she said could come down and I it was again one of those things where I didn't know if I'd ever make any money at it or if it would it was a successful choice in terms of work but that you know as soon as I talked to her I really got what she said, and, and I appreciated her, um, you know, way of connecting what she did with her hands and with people's bodies with their mind um, or their emotional experience. I got that the first time that I saw her from just what she said uh, and how she talked about it, and I, you know, it really added up for me. It made a lot of sense, and I didn't know anybody else who talked like that. And, um, mm -hmm. and you know, and I had a real sense that I wanted to learn it, you know, even if whatever I used it for, um, that it would be real worthwhile for me to learn it. And, you know, I was really willing to have her uh, teach me everything she knew and, and to kind of surrender to her as a... That surrender is the second thought. <laughs> well, it took me a while to be able to do it, but, you know. We <laughs> <laughs> fought like cats and dogs. <laughs> yeah. Not so easy How come? To Don't say that. That's stubbornness. not so. <laughs> it took me ten but years you, or maybe... Your so. body is saying that. Right. No. <laughs> yes. But it also taught me how to work with stubborn right. people, <laughs> which I'm very grateful for now. Uh, she's not quite stubborn in you. No, she isn't. Yeah. Uh, that is the thing, you know, to connect the stubbornness to sadness, mm -hmm. to having it only one way. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's no life, there's no fluidity. So, 
I think she got the lesson. <laughs> forgotten about, about that cute little girl. So how long did uh, you train Sarah and how did, how did it evolve from there in terms of your... Uh, <coughs> what involved was an absolute avalanche of, of clients. What? It was an avalanche of clients. Mm -hmm. You know, we who hardly had anything to do, all of a sudden found ourselves totally swamped with people. I brought a few people from who were teaching our students at Esalen and you know you know that it just happened to be my friends and they were like really in touch with a lot of people who were big bodywork names or students of theirs or something like that and a few of them tried Mary and they couldn't believe that she'd been hiding here in her basement in Oakland all these years <laughs> and they recognized immediately that she was like really you know I had never heard of bodywork before either. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know there was anything else going well, what on. What year is this? When did, what year was this, Sarah? <coughs> 72, uh -huh. January 72. Right. Oh, right. I'd taken Estes July 71. So it was uh, six months after that. It was the right time. I mean, there was a lot of going on. There was a lot of consciousness going on, you know, new so. New yeah, stuff. except I hadn't gotten to it. Nothing had touched my little basement. Mm -hmm. I was raising Tina at the time, so I had my hands full. I had some workshops that I was giving, some for Esalen and some for the Geffian School. And uh, Ganva, Ganva Ingeborg was, one, was in my first uh, workshop that I ever gave. And she was interested. She was really very interested in what was going on. And as far as I remember, I was not very clear at that time. So you have to sit here. Oh. Yeah, mm -hmm. sit here. And I was just saying, you know, about teaching and how you came into being. And I was teaching that class at Fort Gunver at the Gaffian School. And there were several people who were you know, very good and very interested. That was all about it. And there were several people who said they wanted some private treatments afterwards. And at that time, I still had time to give private treatments afterwards. And among them was Louise. Yeah. And all that really had happened was that she came for treatments. And then I gave another workshop, and she turned up in the workshop mm -hmm. again. And I don't really know what else I did, but wherever I turned, <laughs> wherever I did something, <laughs> there was Louise. <laughs> and I think we went along for quite a while <coughs> that way. And one day I said to her, <coughs> I don't know if you're aware of it, but I'm training you. And she said, yes. That's how it was. It wasn't not even an intention of training her. It was just that she stuck around. So the next lesson was, you don't have to want to be trained, you just have to stick around. <laughs> yeah. to stick around and be, you know, there long enough to get something. <coughs> but I found out so that with some it worked, and with some it didn't work. But after a while, I found that Louise was also bringing people in for treatment. She worked on them. She had also had massage training. She had some other training with Gunver, quite a bit mm -hmm. of you know, some psychological training. So she had a lot of background, which I usually didn't like, you know, that people, but she also could put that all aside and just learn what I had to offer at that time, without having to say, but it should be that way, you know, or it should be the other way. She said, okay, we'll do it that way. You know, I did it. And as it turned out, she started getting, having very good results with the people we worked on. So she got even more people coming. <laughs> and then it came to the point, you know, by that time, Sarah had started with her own practice. 
But Sarah at that time didn't want much contact with me. She wanted to get away from mother, wanted to get her own style, wanted to get her own way of working and not really be connected with me a lot anymore. Occasionally she would, <coughs> she would check in again, but mostly she would work on her own. So from then on in it was actually that I worked with Louise mm. and taught her. It was lucky for me that Sarah wanted to go out on her own. That's right, <laughs> yeah. But mm -hmm. about this time. How was it from your perspective, Louise? How did you get drawn to marry her? What's your side of the thing? <sighs> well, um, I, I moved out here to California um, to, to learn to do body work. I actually wanted to become a golfer. And um, I. I was in South Carolina in in school studying psychology and also was in a nursing nursing school. But somehow I knew I wanted to work with the mind and the body. And that's all I that's what I knew. You you became a psychiatric nurse and that's how you work with both of them. And then I just happened to come to California one summer, this is several years ago, and went to some workshops at Ethelin and found out about body work. And uh, immediately went back to, Cal to South Carolina, quit school, and moved out here. <laughs> and, um, but uh, what I knew about, really, at that point, mostly was rolfing. And so I thought, well, I'll become a rolfer. And I came to California to get some massage training before applying to the Rolf and Rolfing Institute. And when I got out here, I realized there was a lot more to body work than just rolfing. And so I did the massage training and then um, studied with Gunder Ingeborg in a, in a long-term bodywork training program in which uh, we invited several people in as guest instructors. And Marion was one of those people. And this is after really studying with most of the people that I'd heard about in the Bay Area who were really good. And nothing was quite right, you know, I mean, I, I study some neo reikian work and some sensory awareness and this and that. And it was all interesting, but nothing quite hit the spot. And uh, when Marion came in to be a guest teacher in this training program, she the minute I saw her put her hand on someone's back, she didn't even move her hand. She just put her hand there. And I knew that this was it. I just knew that I found what I was looking for. And I didn't have any idea what it was. But she didn't was tell it. me, but. <laughs> <coughs> so I was, I was too shy <laughs> to tell you. But um, and she's right. Where After that, wherever Mary was, I was there. Yes. And um, that's, that's how it was, you know. Yeah. And uh, that's how it started. <laughs> so her teaching was maybe a little bit different than Sarah's. Because by that time, I had been thinking a little bit more mm -hmm. about what it was about. <coughs> I also had been talking to her a little more about what it was about. You know, so I had put some of the ideas out because I also found that I did have ideas about what happened with the body and what happened with the emotions. And here was a somebody a sounding board and at the same time to get some feedback you know her ideas about it and talking about it well anyway there were workshops you know that she was in and then finally there was a workshop and I said well you know let's do it together was that it mm -hmm. I don't even mm -hmm. I know how it happened he said why don't you do a demonstration oh <laughs> yeah you know, something like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know see how you work mm -hmm. and to the great surprise you know here she was doing a demonstration that was producing the same result was doing the same kind of thing that I had had in mind and that's how it was Marion goes on to describe the development of training classes in the Rosen method of body work and the formation of the Rosen Institute to support this work. 
The interview ends with Marion's response to the question, what's left? What's incomplete? You know, so it's, it's a beautiful unfolding. And I'm wondering, is there, you know, what's left? What's incomplete? I know you don't know literally there what's is, next. <coughs> I think, something in it that I'm not quite sure about. And that there is some spiritual uh, aspect to it that I feel is coming out in the work more and more in all of us who are working with it. And I know that the people who connect to it are really doing the work in a very different way than the people who are not connecting to it. This is all I can say, and I do not know yet what, what the future will bring for that. Mm-hmm.